Every summer, people from around the world come to the Niagara region to visit the forts and participate in reenactments of the Battle of 1812. For the reenactors, it's more than a hobby, it's a passion. And here at Fort Erie, they live, eat, and breathe their roles. Uh, well, basically, I'm the uh, head of the British forces in, uh, in Canada. And we plan uh, something called the Grand Tactical, which is a, a, the one biggest War of 1812 event each year, uh, in conjunction with our American counterparts. We do the reenactments at the actual historic sites where most of the actions occurred, and usually in a weekend they'll have three or four battle reenactments, one of which will be the battle that happened on that site. A single reenactment may represent several battles that actually took place. And during the fighting that takes place during what we call the Siege of Fort Erie is a series of battles that last six weeks in the late summer of 1814 and resulted in uh, over 3,000 casualties combined. So this is in fact Canada's bloodiest battlefield. Lieutenant Dunfor, real name Phil Mazel from Oakville, is the regimental surgeon for the incorporated militia of Upper Canada. Snap! <laughs> and your arm is off. Behind the lines, you'll see women trying to help the wounded. Mary Ann Cole and women working with her are credited as being the first paid nurses in the U.S. Army. Nurses weren't the only women around the camp. Out of a hundred soldiers, perhaps seven would have been allowed to bring their wives. And if her husband was killed in battle, a wife would have two to three days to claim a new husband. It would be for her own protection, and it would also stop her being a burden on the army because she would have a husband that would look after her. Often it is even prearranged that if her husband dies, a friend would be responsible for her and her children. In one campaign, she might go through even seven or eight husbands. With the bulk of its army off fighting Napoleon, the British relied heavily on their native allies. Well, we have a reenactment group called Anguahonwe, or the people of Turtle Island, which represents the 30 different nations that fought under the great chief Tecumseh and allied itself with the British during the War of 1812. They came as far south as the Seminoles of Florida, to as far north as the Ojibwe's of Northern Ontario, as far east as the Kanawagi Mohawks near Montreal, and as far west as the Dakota of the Western Prairies. All fought together as allies during that war. Many different cultures, many languages, many different ways, but the common cause brought them together. Traders supplied goods to the natives. Now, the natives would trap these mainly in the wintertime. It's when they would be trapping. And then they would exchange... The traders rarely went on the battlefield, but would establish themselves nearby. The, uh, the hawk. I would trade uh, items from everywhere. The, I would get them from the French, I would get them from the English, any merchant that would work with me. And that included the Hudson's Bay Company, who invented a unique pricing system. These four bars was an indication that the cost of this prized blanket was four beaver pelts. On the field of battle, the color of the uniforms was critical in determining your friend or foe. When the British Royal Navy blockaded the American coast, supplies to the U.S. Army were cut off, and that included shipments of the blue wool worn by American regulars. Winfield Scott of the 1st Brigade was given the opportunity to have all his men uniformly uh, clothed, but in gray roundabout jackets as opposed to the blue coatees. Uh, the brigade did so well, of course, that today the uniform at West Point for the uh, American uh, U.S. Army Military College is gray in honor of the 1st Brigade. For more information, visit our website on topoftheworld.net.